PhD disclosures. Now we'll be starting off with the session on investors' perspective. So uh, for that, uh, I'd like to welcome, first of all, all our uh, distinguished speakers of the session. Some of the speakers would also be joining us virtually. Just to reiterate, I would just like to say that uh, in order to reduce the footprint, certain initiatives like reduced use of paper, no usage of plastic bottles, cotton-based backdrops, and hoardings and signages have been used in the summit. Now, I'd like to call our moderator of this session on investors perspective, Mr. Sanjeev Kumar Singhal, who is the chairman of Sustainability Reporting Standards Board and Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, ICAI, to initiate the session. So please. I would also request all the panelists to please come on stage for the session. Thank you. Hi, uh, very good afternoon to you all. Uh, so in this session, we'll be talking from the investor's perspective. I'm Sanjeev Singhal, Central Council Member of the Institute of Chartered Accountant of India and a partner with Ernst & Young Assurance Practice uh, in India. In this, uh, we have uh, four uh, very distinguished panelists, Mr. Nilesh Shah, Managing Director, Kotak Mahindra Asset Management Company, who is joining us virtually. Welcome, Nilesh. Second is Priya Subra, um, Subraman, Chief Regulatory Officer, National Stock Exchange Limited, uh, who is with us on the dais. Welcome, uh, Priya. Ms. Deepa Agarwal, who is the Chief Representative of SGX India Liza Office, who is on the dais. We welcome you, Deepa. And Mr. Shrey Kohli, Head of the, capital, the Debt Capital Markets and Product Origination, London Stock Exchange, was again with us on the dais. Thank you, Shrey, for joining. Friends, ESG has become a cornerstone of every discussion. And ESG is our future. ESG investing or the investor perspective is what we are going to talk about in this session. And why ESG has become important, we all know. The efforts are on for building a healthier, happier, and a safer planet. The 17 sustainable development goals given by the United Nations needs to be achieved by 2030. And I was briefly listening in the previous session when we were talking about circular economy and the consumption. As human beings together, by 15th of August every year, we consume the annual resources of the earth. Means in seven and a half months, our consumption is equal to 12 months. Means we are borrowing from the next year and borrowing from the next generation. So obviously that cannot continue. But how to convince people? Probably market's perspective or the investor's perspective is the best because that's a language which is best understood. Though it is, there is no doubt that we'll have to shift from the single P to the triple P, which is planet, people, and profit, and in that order. So there are a number of initiatives which are going on. Uh, BRSR has become mandatory from this year for top 1,000 companies. And I'll be requesting when Priya is speaking to briefly touch upon BRSR and at the Institute of Chartered Accountant of India, we also come out with the concept of sustainability reporting maturity model, which is a self evaluation against the BRSR matrices. Then social stock exchange has been recently announced and uh, few listings are expected pretty soon. Again, ICI has taken up the task of developing the social audit standards. ESG assurance is also being talked about. And probably this may come from this year for a certain class of companies. And India is leading the global initiatives. There's a talk about green finance and many research projects are going on. So in this session, we will take uh, from the investor's perspective. And uh, uh, we're very, very happy that Nilesh 
is here and uh, the structure of the discussion the way we want to keep it that uh, probably each panelist will speak about five to seven minutes on the theme and uh, then I have some questions for my panelists and then we'll follow it up with the Q&A from the audience. We are aware of uh, uh, the schedule, time schedule that we are lagging behind and we'll make sure that we stick to our time. So with this, uh, can I request now Nilesh and uh, Nilesh, if you can focus on the ESG investment vehicles and the ESG ratings in your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you. ESG is the buzzword, but it is not the responsibility of just one class of institution to carry it forward. It will require collaborative effort from everyone. As investor community, there are multiple models available for us to carry forward the work of ESG investing. At Escotec Mutual Fund, we were the first mutual fund in the country to join hence with United Nations of Principal Responsible Investing. This UNPRI is a charter where more than 3,000 fund managers have come together to share a common minimum standard for ESG investment. And also, how do we collaborate with each other? On the governance side, I think we have been supported by regulator quite nicely. And by and large, we understand how to take governance forward. On the social side, again, the challenges are different across different countries and different companies. What is acceptable in one geography is probably avoidable in another geography. With the help of NGOs, with the help of think tanks, we are able to make some impact on social side. Environmental, our own knowledge is limited. The field itself is evolving. And it's very difficult to argue with companies if they present contrary data. While the regulators are putting a lot of effort on disclosure to engage with corporates for sustainable environment is not an easy task. We have joined hands with a group called Climate Action 100. This is where fund managers have come together to engage with top 100 polluting companies in the world. There are a couple of them present in India. The fund manager community together, globally as well as locally, come together to engage with such companies. We are able to learn from global companies' experience, and we are able to understand environmental issues in far better depth thanks to these engagements, which we can then pass it on to other companies. It's a journey. We have barely begun our journey, but it's a matter of pride that when our ratings have come in UNPRI, by and large, we have remained above global average or global median. SEBI, our regulator, also has constituted a group for ESG investment, how we avoid greenwashing, how we can take ESG in a real effective manner on the ground. My colleague Harsha Upadhyay is a member of that group. Hopefully, we'll be able to work under the guidance of SEBI to create equivalent of UNPRI in India. Hopefully, we will be able to make a happier and healthier India in the days to come with our effort. But as I mentioned, the work which we are doing is like lighting a candle in the darkness. We'll be able to dispel some amount of darkness, but will require effort from everyone so that this entire darkness can be removed. Thank you. Thank you, Nilesh. Uh, you put up this perspective pretty nicely. I'll come back to you for some questions. Uh, Priya, moving to you. Can you throw some light in your opening remarks uh, relating to what is the NSC perspective on this uh, topic uh, from the investor's perspective and also talk about the BRSR? Sure, let me go with BRSR. 
that uh, there's a lot more positive uh, story for us at the moment. So uh, you already said in uh, in your opening remarks, uh, Sanjeev, that uh, uh, that Sabi has come up with uh, Sar, um, uh, yeah. and uh, therefore the top thousand companies from next year it's going to become compulsory this year. Uh, no, so yeah, 20 to 23. And what we have found is for 21, 22, about 160 out of the thousand companies. Not everybody is part of the thousand, but 160 companies have actually voluntarily filed. So to that extent, uh, that is more uh, you know encouraging that people are trying to get uh, in a way prepared for BRSR filing. The other part is, and uh, Sabi has been pushing this for a really long time, not just for BRSR, but uh, every other uh, reporting that can happen to the exchange. Obviously, what we don't want to do is to go through, uh, you know, reams of information to try and understand a particular piece of um, uh, piece of information that's that's there. So we are, what we're looking for in BRSR is actually XBRL kind of filing. And, uh, you know, uh, NSC has been doing a lot of um, seminars. We have introduced XBRL. We've been doing webinars and seminars to actually get uh, the the corporates prepared for uh, the BRSR filing as and when it does become compulsory, which is uh, the coming year. See, one other thing is uh, so BRSR. The way it goes is you don't It's not a standard by itself, right? So there is a GRI. There is um, there is uh, integrated reporting. There are a bunch of standards. So if a company chooses to cho to you know if you will opt for any other standard, what uh, BRSR does is to actually tell you that what is the standard that you are adopting and how does it how does it fit in the larger scheme of things. So that's all is expected. This is not a new standard. So to that extent, there is certainly acceptability from the corporates, at least the corporates that we have spoken to. So as NSC, you asked uh, um, what, we've been, what we've done, we've taken actually one more step uh, in conjunction with a proxy advisory firm, we have actually issued about um, 38 um, uh, BRSR guidance. It's available on our website for 38 sub industries. Therefore, there's a each of these uh, guidance notes are about 100 odd pages. But what uh, the guidance note actually does is to tell you what is uh, what you have to do, what is expected in BRSR, what is the equivalent standard in say GRI, IR, and so on and so forth. And what are the questions that you can potentially answer over and above the BRSR itself? So, so if you want to give a much more holistic picture in terms of where you stack up against various standards, you can do that by using that guide. So it's free, freely available. It's, it's available on our website. And uh, you know I can send it to the organizers of um, sustainability um, as well for, for giving to its members. So that's what uh, we've been doing from a BRSR perspective. And we, we, so the other part is what is being reported, what is the quality of the reporting? That's something which, as I just mentioned, about 160 odd companies um, have actually reported. So we are trying to see what's the quality. Can we make some changes there? I, I mean, as in we can suggest changes if there are questions that are, that are a bit obvious, but they're not answered, then what do we do? But coming back to the second question, how are investors? So, uh, you know, post pandemic, I think this um, this particular um, piece of information has been out there, where uh, you, the, the number of investors, just what each of us has read, that the number of investors in the markets have doubled. So, in the first 24 years of our existence, I think we had about three and a half crore clients. Uh, unique pan numbers, so to speak, and in the in the past two or three years, we've got another three and a half. So, we literally doubled the investor base. But uh, if you think about, so I would divide it. Um, so, when you think about uh, NSC as an exchange, there is obviously the cash market where people are buying shares of a company, and then there is derivatives. Uh, and um, what we see is that there's a to shift towards uh, when we think about the turnover of the exchange there's a very clear shift towards derivatives so what it seems to me is that when when putting your um, money where your where mouth is in a way uh, investors are actually going towards derivatives not so much towards cash so that's uh, we've seen a very marked shift towards um, towards uh, derivative trading options trading really so that that is that's where the investors are but th that would be more retail investors a lot of the um, institutional investors clearly uh, cash and and we've seen you know investments in specific stocks which are known for their governance and so on so that's that's uh, that's the trend that we are seeing i will stop here thank you in fact this is indeed encouraging that 160 companies have already reported on brsr and at the 
Institute of Chartered Accountant of India, we have instituted awards for sustainability reporting. And some of these awards are for PRSA. So, you know, we are also looking forward keenly and there's a strong evaluation that will go into while giving these awards. Thank you, Priya, and I'll come back to you uh, for some questions. Deepa, uh, in your opening remarks, if you can kindly focus on the disclosure requirement uh, relating to ESG, and uh, in India, at least the ICI is thinking of a concept called integrated performance statement. See, what is happening is that currently we have financial statement, and now we have the non-financial statement or the BRSR. And we talk about ISSB, they are coming out with a plethora of disclosure requirement. To my mind, of course, these are going to be counterproductive because these are too many and uh, yeah, probably form will take over the substance. So there may be a need to come out with something which integrates both integrated performance statement. Uh, so firstly, you can focus on respond from the Singapore's perspective. And if you have any perspective on Combining the two set into one and reducing the disclosure overload, would happy to hear you uh, on that as well. Thanks, Sanjeev. Um, yeah, I'll, in introduction remarks, I'd like to just throw a little bit of light on what we as SGX in Singapore, what, the, what our vision is and what we're doing in the area of sustainability. Uh, until recently, no one really associated an exchange with really a topic like sustainability, but as we dig deeper, there's really a lot behind it. So coming back to our vision, uh, SGX's vision is to be the leading sustainable and credible transition finance and trade hub with end-to-end -end solutions, products, and ecosystems. So broadly, if I were to divide it in three categories, SGX as a company, SGX as a business and SGX as a regulator. So as a company, we want to demonstrate leadership and there are a couple of firsts that we do have to our name. I think we're the first exchange in APAC to um, be listing green bonds. We have uh, um, you know, targets of net zero and we are a member of GFANS. As a business, we want to offer the ecosystem, the infrastructure across various asset classes towards sustainability. And as a regulator, which is the point, Sanjeev, you spoke about disclosures. As a regulator, we want to guide the market on sustainable sustainability related disclosures. And um, we've actually, you know, walked the talk by just very recently on the 12th of September this month. Uh, SGX, along with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, have collaborated and launched what we call ESG Norm, which is a disclosure platform available for all our listed companies. It's not mandatory, but it's a platform which will standardize the matrix. What the feedback we got was that there are very many different matrices, different um, measuring points for sustainability across different geographies, et cetera. So we've come out with this portal, um, which will start off with the 27 core ESG indices, and it's up to the issuer to upload it. And it's a very customer friendly format that those 27 can then be at the click of a button, print out a sustainability report in the different formats required worldwide. So this is our latest initiative, um, ES Genome, and um, it's, uh, we hope it will give, the idea really behind it also is to give the investors the best platform to be able to take decisions with the best information available in a more standardized, an easy format to compare peer-to-peer -peer or apple-to-apple -apple comparisons. So that's our latest initiative, ES Genome, to make the whole disclosures easier and more transparent. Thank you. In fact, this idea is pretty interesting uh, because, yeah, if a standardized format can be developed and if it can be transposed into any of the format required across the world, that will save a lot of time and effort. 
Thank you. Shri, moving on to you, and you are a debt market expert. Uh, so in your experience, how attractive is this market as of now? And how deep is this market? And anything that can be done to improve its attractiveness? Uh, if you can cover this in your opening theme. Thank you. No, thank, thank you very much, Sanjeev. And to my uh, esteemed panelists, um, I thought it was best to perhaps start uh, mentioning a few of the things that Nilesh mentioned in terms of what are global investors coalescing around when it comes to ESG, the transition to net zero, and the support of the green economy. Uh, Nilesh mentioned Climate Action 100 Plus. Um, Deepa mentioned um, GFANS, which is the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. Um, there are multiple other initiatives, including the Transition Pathway Initiative and the UNPRI, where investors over 100 trillion of assets under management have effectively committed to incorporating socially ESG responsible principles, both in terms of the selection of companies within their portfolios and then reporting on the impact of their investments. So this is a major global movement. Now, uh, a lot of people ask me in terms of the relevance of the London Stock Exchange Group uh, in India, and there's a lot of association of the LSE group with the LSE. Uh, and yes, you know, London is a global center for raising finance. We have relationships with about 3,000 companies issuers globally, um, including a number from India and about $700 billion of capital raised. But we also have a large index management arm that sits within the business, which provides indices to investors, which they can then use for their portfolios, whether they be you know, more active portfolios in terms of data management or more passive portfolios in terms of following it, benchmarking to a certain index. Um, and our uh, asset owner survey of 2022, which covers about 3 trillion of asset under management, is just about to come out. But I received some of the headline figures so I could share from an investor perspective what's happening globally. Um, so a few of the figures are about 83% of investors globally are looking at incorporating sustainable finance within their investment decisions of that 3 trillion of assets under management, which is a very significant component. Um, and the reasons why they do so are quite interesting as well. 60% of those investors in Asia have said that the number one reason is to mitigate medium and longer term investment risk. Right, so climate risk and ESG risk or social risk is a key factor in terms of what the decision making is going to be in the future. More interestingly, the second most uh, factor which was quoted by APAC investors was ensuring investment return. So we're far away from the debate, which was five to 10 years ago, that ESG is more about corporate social responsibility. It's now fundamental in terms of the returns that you make for your investors at the end of the day. Um, and I find that interesting because it's, it's also shown in terms of uh, issuance that we see in the market. Over a trillion dollars has now been raised in ESG financing through green social sustainability bonds. Uh, India is growing in terms of that size. Last year, there was about $20 billion of international debt which was issued from India. About 20% of that was in green format, which shows how companies are moving towards figuring out where their investments are and aligning them with global taxonomies. And that fits in with what exchanges are trying to do globally as well. We are trying to create segments for issuers to raise capital through across different asset classes, whether they be debt, whether they be close-ended investment funds, whether they be open-ended instruments, or whether they be equity. The LSE was the first exchange to launch a green equity mark, which looks at companies and the percentage of the revenues that they make in certain sectors. Um, and sovereigns are responding as well. I mean, it's a very positive step that uh, her, um, the Honorable Finance Minister of India announced in the budget that India issues to in, uh, intends to issue green uh, bonds as GSEX in the future. Uh, I think once that happens, there will be a benchmark curve for corporates to price their green debt against in India as well, which will really stimulate issuance from India. So the, 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 the key message is this is a movement which is not changing from an investor perspective because it is key in terms of returns in the future, not just for corporate social responsibility. Now it's time to take some questions from my side and then invite questions from the audience. Uh, Nilesh, if I can ask you a question that as an institution, since you use the ESG scores, provided by the third party. How do you comprehend or deal with the disagreements, if any, between the various ESG ratings available in the market and what determines the reliability 
of such rating providers. So Sanjeev, we haven't reached the stage where there are conflicting ratings on companies. We are at a stage where it's difficult to get ratings for all the companies in which we are investing. But as I mentioned, this is a journey. We have just begun. We will always be short of what an activist would like us to do. But as an investor, we have to balance return vis-a-vis -vis companies' ability to deliver ESG performance. Uh, as of today, a lot of ESG ratings are from global agencies like Sustain Analytics. There are a couple of local agencies which have now started moving aggressively into this space. SES Services, Crystal, uh, they are all now moving into sustainable uh, sustainability ratings. And uh, we are you know, picking up uh, probably the best from where it is available. And where there are disagreements, we try to go back to the company and effectively ask them to engage with the agencies to improve their score. There is a big gap between what many companies are doing versus what they are being assessed. And this is not small and mid-cap companies I'm talking about. I'm talking about some large companies where they didn't know that they were rated on such parameters. So this is an evolving scenario, probably like mid nineties when credit rating was introduced. Today it is firmly established, but in those days there were lots of challenges. I'm sure if we work with regulator, issuer, the rating agencies and investors, will be able to create a robust mechanism on sustainability ratings, just like credit ratings. Thank you, Nilesh. Let me ask you, uh, okay, you want to add? Yeah. Say, so uh, to just the point that Nilesh made, so last year we did a report of uh, top 50 companies. It's not the Nifty 50 because uh, we had uh, we didn't have companies in the banking sector or um, companies that were uh, in the IT, but uh, there are 100,000 data points. So to the, the point that Nilesh made that some of the companies did not even realize that uh, there are these benchmarks against which they would be scored, it was quite a shock to them. And it might be interesting to see what the results were. So we did, uh, when we looked at uh, the 50 companies, um, the, we looked at four things, E, S, and G, obviously, and also the policy perspective. So uh, policy, almost everybody was up there. So it, it looks to me that uh, India Inc. loves writing policies. Everybody has written a policy and kept it. Then we looked at the governance side. I think for the longest time, uh, you know, governance has been pushed by uh, SEBI as well. And, and governance was, so if I look at the top company and the bottom company, the gap was not that much. The environment and the S was dramatically different. The top company and the bottom company, the, the difference was so much. So the learning that companies need to get in order to, you know, even narrow the gap, I think is going to be quite substantial. I thought it might be interesting to, to make that point. Sorry, sorry for- no, no, Absolutely. Thank you, Priya. Uh, Shrey, since you mentioned about the sovereign green bonds and green finance, so What's your global perspective on uh, that, uh, you know, uh, what is the difference in the pricing of green finance vis-a-vis -vis the normal finance uh, globally? And uh, any, any views on looking at the interest rate in India, that what is that rate of interest or uh, which will attract people to do, to make green investments in India? Yeah, so I think, Pricing is a major concern which comes out of companies that we speak to in terms of what are the incentives if, in issuing uh, capital through what is a sustainability format, right? Because there is a cost associated with it. Now, the cost associated with it is the, on the governance side, you need to set up a sustainability framework. You need to be able to identify your capital expenditures and map them to certain categories, you know, whether they be climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, pollution control, amongst others. You have to set up a governance mechanism whereby you can ensure that when you tell investors you're investing in certain projects, the proceeds actually go there. And you also have to then ensure that those are managed through the lifetime of the issuance and report them. So this exercise is not a simple exercise. 
but I would think it's a necessary exercise given the mandatory disclosure regimes which are coming in the future. And it's a base layer of governance that most companies will be expected to apply in the future. So we encourage companies to think of this cost as sunk cost, because once you do it, you have the mechanisms ready to monitor things in the future. Now, in terms of pricing, what we've seen in the market is as the issuance in global sustainable debt has increased, for sovereigns, we have seen new issuance discounts or benefit of green issuance or sustainable issuance as compared to other issuance, anywhere between five and seven basis points. And these are largely for developed economies, right? So we're talking about countries like the Republic of Korea, Germany, United Kingdom. And on the EM side, we've seen countries like uh, Chile, Mexico, Egypt, and a number of other countries which are intending to issue in sustainable format. In the corporate sector, it varies based on what is your credit rating, right? And which sector you're in. So there was a very interesting study done by BNP Paribas, which showed that across different sectors, the premium could be anyways between seven basis points and 35 basis points. So there is a net result because there are investors who are looking for ESG paper, but not only are they looking for ESG paper, they're looking for an articulation of an ESG strategy. And that's become more and more apparent in hard to abate sectors as well. If you look at you know, very good performers in India, uh, two sustainability linked bonds which came out were from companies like Jindal Steel and you heard from Mr. Prabodh Acharya earlier today. Uh, as well as ultra tech cement. Now these are critical to the net zero transition. And what they've said is they've linked their emissions targets to their fundraising and have said, if we fail to meet these targets, then we will pay investors a penalty. Now in the future, we may even see a structure where there is a benefit to these companies if they hit the targets. But the market is evolving and there is certainly a, a, a pricing advantage that we're seeing, which will become more acute as interest rates go up. There's only one direction for interest rates in the near future, I think. Thanks, uh, Nilesh. Uh, if I had to extend the same question to you and ask, say, from the perspective of, say, companies like oil and gas, and, and as, as Shrey mentioned, Ultratech, Cement, and those companies which are maybe one of the highest emitter of carbon, and if uh, they are to be incentivized, that to, what is the pricing in terms of the discount on the normal financing that will attract these companies? See, one is a statutory obligation. Second is a voluntary movement towards that so any perspective that from a developing economy point of view that what pricing will attract uh, companies towards undertaking green capital expenditure so sanjeev there is no one right answer when we go to corporate india they say you know we are the lowest per capita carbon emitter in the world let people who have polluted the world pay for it when we go to investors globally who invest in our funds, which we then go and invest into Indian companies, their expectation is that the responsibility of improving climate is for everyone. Benefits are going to be enjoyed by everyone. So the cost should be shared equally. These are two extreme positions within which we'll have to find an equilibrium. We believe there is no one carrot which will drive behavior. There will be multiple carrots which we will have to tangle. For a cement company, it's not only the reduction in cost of borrowing which will excite them. It is also the valuation which they will get or market cap which they will create for the effort put in being a better ESG company versus inferior ESG company. We'll also have to engage with the promoters about not only the monetary benefits, but also the benefits which they otherwise will get from the surrounding environment near their factories, which will help facilitate better business environment for them. So there's no one right answer for this. We'll have to continuously engage with issuer, investor, borrower, lender. We'll have to create right mechanism in market so that appropriate behavior is rewarded. It might be a slow beginning, but eventually it will pick up its own momentum. And like today, there is a big valuation gap versus good governed company and bad governed company. There will be wide valuation gap and appropriate incentive for good ESG company and a bad ESG company. Thank you. Uh, 
I agree. Sanjeev, my apologies. I'll have to leave for another meeting. So, sure. Thank you so much for inviting and me over here. And thank you for your kind allowing presence. Allowing me to share my thank thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Deepa, I have to come back to you and uh, because you mentioned about disclosures. So what's been your experience around the world that uh, does more disclosure means more ASG compliant or better governance? Or uh, do you have examples of countries or economies which have limited disclosures and uh, they're pretty meaningful and can be followed by countries like India? Thanks, Sanjeev. I think we are just at the kind of beginning of disclosures and trying to analyze and see the depth and the meaning and um, you know how much is greenwashed and how much is genuine. So I think um, we're still at the beginning, but uh, as as we're getting you know more serious and the you know compliance issues are increasing, etc., it uh, will only increase. So far, we've uh, seen um, you know good dis disclosures but obviously like i had mentioned earlier in very many different formats so there's no one single formula also how to measure how green is green so you know the quant both the quantitative and the qualitative aspects of measurement need to be standardized which is what we're trying to achieve and once there is a equal platform to be able to compare that's when i think we'll give much more meaning to all these disclosures and, uh, you know, there's a different timeline across different countries like India's, you know, 22, 23, Singapore's made it mandatory uh, from now on itself. So, you know, we will in these coming years see much more and see more depth to that. Thank you. Uh, we can take a few questions from the participants. So, if yes, uh, can someone help pass on the mic uh, at the back? that lady and if you can also ma'am identify to for whom your question is meant i am susanna hasenel from sap uh, uh deepa could you perhaps um kindly enlighten us on, on the um similarities, uh, key similarities and differences between the Singapore SGX um, 27 key uh, metrics and the Indian uh, BRSR, please. So actually for the India bit, I'm going to bank on Priya to be able to throw some more light. Unfortunately, it's very new and I'm not uh, so up to date with uh, the Indian matrices, if you may. See, the Indian one doesn't say what you should or should not do. Obviously, there are uh, leading indicators and there are essential indicators. But what BRSR does is to say whatever metric you're following, that's fine, whether it's GRI, whether it is uh, integrated reporting, it doesn't really matter. You follow your own. They, there are also, uh, there's also a set of explanations that have been given, which sort of says that if, if you're not following anything, and, and it's very unlikely that you would, that would be the case, but nevertheless, if you're not following anything and you want to, uh, you know, um, measure yourself on uh, BRSR, these are the ways, this is the explanation that Sebi has given as to each metric, how you need to um, benchmark yourself or measure yourself. However, if you're already doing your IR or GRI or any other kind, you can just stay, stay with it. So there's no there's no push in that sense to adopt something which is which is very Indian, uh, if I'm if if uh, I may say that uh, you can continue to follow your own. Just say how you're following, what you're following, how you're following, and how consistent you are. I unfortunately don't know the Singapore side of it, so I'm. So I think that's very different in Singapore, like I mentioned in ES genome. Um, out of the 3,000 odd matrices, we've identified 27 core matrices which are extremely specific. And uh, the issuer needs to populate the, uh, you know, on the portal, on the web page, in the format given, which can then be used to kind of calibrate and calculate others. But the 27 core have been identified and it's a dynamic process as the uh, you know population begins disclosures and reporting. Those 27 can obviously be increased and you know edited around. So I think there's quite a big difference between how both the countries are looking at it. Yeah, but India is also looking at assurance around some limited core matrices. 
So ultimately, you know, there will be disclosure for the full and assurance to start with around some core matrices. So that is a work in progress. Any other? Yes. Uh, can a mic be passed on on the front table? I would request CIA to let us know how much time is left so that we take up the questions. Accordingly. Thank you. Uh, Sanjeev, you asked an interesting question to Nilesh. I really wonder whether Nilesh answered that. Uh, but that's a question that comes from a corporate uh, to the ladies and gentlemen on the on the dais. See, uh, for a responsible corporate who would go through the ESG promise, report and disclose, you know, put up a pathway to net zero. Uh, for a hard to abate industry, he actually sacrifices his EBITDA margins to be able to meet the targets that he has set. Uh, that is what the corporate does because the financial world is now demanding it. But now what? What is the advantage he is going to get in the marketplace or in the uh, capital marketplace as well, or the debt marketplace as well? The, I thought that is a question you asked. Uh, yeah, Nilesh. But he partly answered in terms of the valuation, and I think Shrey want to uh, answer it from the debt market perspective. Yeah, I mean, I can also give you a few case studies of what we're seeing in the asset management community, right? So uh, through our business in FTSE Russell, we have relationships with a number of pension funds globally, right? And pension funds effectively hold assets for us at the end of the day in terms of, uh, you know, what we're going to spend once all of us retire, which hopefully we will at some point in time and the world won't have uh, fallen apart by then. But uh, we're seeing very large pension funds, including the likes of HSBC's pension funds, which are now tilting their asset allocation towards indices which are balanced by ESG weights, right? And that's across asset classes. So to Nilesh's point, if you are an outperformer in a certain sector, because of the nature of information you disclose, so for example, are you disclosing your scope one, scope two, scope three emissions on the E side? Have you established targets for yourself? Uh, are you are those are those targets challenging from a sector benchmark perspective? Are they aligned to your country's NCD contributions? If they are, you have a higher weight in that index as opposed to other indices. Uh, climate also, action. Sorry, also compared to peers. Absolutely, uh, and sector specific, you're starting to see divergences even in hard to abate sectors, right? So another entity that we part we partner with is called the Transition Pathway Initiative. And I urge you to go to their website. They have data on 400 companies across different sectors which are in various stages of transition, mostly hard to abate. So through their tool, you can look at sectors like diversified mining, for example. And they rate companies on a scale of one to four based on the level of disclosure they're making and their uh, ambitiousness of their climate targets. And we're working with them to increase the coverage of this to 10,000 listed companies globally. Now, investors are increasingly doing their asset allocation, not only using factors that you see as normal factors, you know, moment momentum, size, amongst others. Uh, they're looking at ESG performance, whether ambitious targets have been set, and climate risk. So at the end of the day, yes, there is an incentive for a corporate to establish those targets, make good disclosures, and explain to investors where they are in their ESG journey. Because if you don't, your asset valuations in the future will be much more detrimental compared to your peers for performing better. So that, I think, is the incentive. Shrey, I understand we do get rated by TPI. We are on that list. But on a short-term basis, uh, I'm saying, would the uh, asset managers be willing to uh, give debts at lower rates. The corporate is putting the money where his mouth is. Would these guys do that? See, to my mind, uh, at some point of time, uh, at least in India, it will need to be done. Uh, what is going to be the extent? Is it going to be five, seven basis point or a 50 basis point? The expectation of some of the corporates that I've talked about is much more than that also. Uh, but how, uh, I mean, what are going to be the government's priority? It is only the government money which can come at a at a lower cost. But we need to see that as and when this sovereign green bond comes, what what's going to be the cost? Priya, you wanted to add something? 
actually have numbers in front of me, so I'm just going to go through some of these numbers. So we, we have two, uh, we have three indices actually, but uh, for a couple of indices, uh, ESG index uh, of NSC, I have uh, the performance. So ESG 100, which is uh, which the inception was in 2011, uh, the, the index returned about 12 point something as a return, as opposed to the Nifty 100, which returned about 10.9. So there's very clearly a whole percentage and some difference between a stock which is in uh, the uh, ESG index and one which is not in the ESG index. Now, it could be a combination of factors, including uh, what Nilesh already mentioned about better governance and so on. But we are in this session for investors. Investors are clearly going to be attracted towards a particular index that is going to give you. And we're talking longer term, right? If I look at three years, the performance is better. Five years performance is better. Seven years performance is better. 10 years performance is better. And 12 years performance is better. And the difference is more than a percent. So when you're thinking about investors investing in those uh, potentially those um, uh, asset classes which yield you better returns. I think uh, ESG has proven itself, at least from an India perspective, for almost 12, 11, 12 years. Thank you, Priya. It's now time to close uh, the session. Yeah, in just, just one more point, Sanjeev. Uh, I mean, anecdotally also, what we've seen is, I mean, at the end of the day, pricing is an equilibrium between supply and demand, right, at the moment, in terms of where a corporate wishes to price its funding for fixed income instrument, for example, and where investors want to provide money. Uh, at least anecdotally, we've heard from the green social and sustainability and sustainability linked issuances from India that companies you know, with well-established fixed income profiles have seen dedicated new in ESG investors on their books as new investors for the first time compared to their conventional instruments. Now, if the demand for ESG paper is also more, then so supply and demand dictates that at some point of time, there will be a spread between what your conventional issuance is and what a sustainability linked issuance or a sustainable issuance is. So even in market dynamics without there being a particular mandate for investors to provide you know a better pricing we are seeing better pricing so there is a so there's definitely a directionality to it thank you Sanjay. thank you thank you Shrey. Uh, with this uh, we'd like to close the session and again you know probably we have been able to make a contribution towards the timely completion we started 15 minutes late and we saved about eight minutes and uh, sustainability is all about consuming resources which includes time which is bare minimum, uh, and I'm extremely thankful to all my panelists, Nilesh, Shrey, Priya, and Deepa, and I'm thankful to CII also for giving this opportunity to be among